forget that dramatic music, that heart-pounding music, that crescendo of warning of the approaching of a great white shark in Jaws. Now, in similar fashion, we're seeing here in John 7 trumpets, you might say a, a crescendo of terror and judgment. We're seeing the divine wrath upon the unbelieving and the announcement, the proclamation of the sovereignty of God upon all creation. In the first four trumpets, it leads way to the last three, which John also calls three woes, which we're going to deal with two today. Now, from a literary viewpoint, let me make sure I'm on here. Uh, uh, from the literary viewpoint, you know, John is intensifying the tone, kind of like a, a producer would with music here. And, and this crescendo of trumpets is leading way to signals of terror, of judgment upon the world, upon the unbelieving. Now, why does John use this intense pictures, if you will, this the sounds, the, the trumpets, if you will. Well, for a couple reasons. Well, one is because those early readers, remember the early church, many of them have flirted with idolatry and become uh, compromised. And we saw that in chapters 2 and 3 with the early churches, those seven churches. Uh, and so he's trying to make it crystal clear the distinction between those that God has called out and he has sealed them in the forehead and those that are set for the eternal wrath of God. And so he's trying to lead the Christian to repentance and perseverance. Secondly, there are those believers who are living under duress. They, they kind of feel like they are being judged by God. They, they're kind of getting swept away in the judgment of everybody else. They're kind of like collateral damage. And, and so... John is pressing the point here that the Lord is exercising his sovereignty even in the judgments, that his intended judgments are not going to miss the, the intended target. So his message here is, don't despair. The Lord reigns. He is in control. Now, remember the book of Revelation is, you know, it's for all Christians for 2,000 years. It's not just about or for the end time. Because Revelation reminds us for, throughout history, if you will, that all the temporal judgments, though man may deal with oppression of the world, the persecutions of the world, the troubles and so forth, we see these pictures that are overlapping. They're not in sequential, sequential order and so forth. And it's trying to remind you and I as Christians, though we may suffer, though we may go through these things, that Christ has shouldered the wrath of God on our behalf that you and I don't have to live in fear. We can live in quiet confidence that our God has accepted us through what Christ has accomplished on the cross. So we don't have to, to fear the coming wrath of God. This is something to help you and I through these times. Now, putting things in a little perspective here, we believe that Jesus Christ is going to come in the clouds and rapture the church. We're going to be caught up in the air and meet Jesus in the air. Kind of like Elijah was caught up in the fiery chariot in the Old Testament. But we see in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Now can I... We, that can happen at any time. I know a lot of people want to know when. They want to know date. They want to know time. They want to know these details. Well, I'm not on the scheduling committee. You know, I'm under kind of the preparation committee here. So the Lord could come at any time. Let's imagine that he could come, let's say he's, he's planning to come in 2025. There's always some that's planning and looking and looking for any inkling of any evidence that when he's coming. And they'll, they'll start looking right now. 2025 looks like a good year for Jesus to come. And they're already planning and everything. And this has been going for 2,000 years. Back at the turn of the first millennium, you know, churches were filled with Christians on New Year's Eve night when it was going to turn from 999 to 1,000. But obviously Jesus didn't come. 
kind of repeat itself in Y2K. Remember those days leading up to 2000 AD? Now, it doesn't have to be 2025. It could be 2023. It could be 2024. It could be 2026. We just don't know when it's going to happen. The Lord knows, but it is going to happen. That's what we need to be assured of, that it will happen. Now, of course, every time something unique happens in our atmosphere, in our solar system, in outer space, you know, the alignment of the stars, you know, blood moon, somebody will begin to write a book or go on a sermon or lecture tour to sell their books and their videos and make big money. It's strange, isn't it? Or is it really that strange? How there's people searching to know the details of when Jesus is coming and the earth is going to be destroyed, but they don't search or seek to find out or to learn about Jesus like Paul did. In Philippians 3, Paul said, says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death. See, knowing the details of the second coming of Christ is not fulfillment of, God, of the Lord's command for us. He calls you and I to be holy, righteous, and to go make disciples. Are we pursuing to please the Lord in those areas? Because that's really our priority. That's what God would have us to do more than anything else here. And, and so, with all that said, we are looking at a time in the future of great terror called the Great Tribulation Period. It's seven years where there's going to be great tribulation and crisis in this world, and it's going to be led by a one-world ruler that the Bible calls the Antichrist. No, we don't know who he is. And no, we don't know when this is all going to happen. And I'll just be real frank. I'm not enjoying much of this. I, I, I enjoy Revelation, but I'm just not enjoying the tribulation because it is depicting such wrath and judgment. This isn't fun. And that's kind of why I kick in a little bit of fun here and there where I can have it. All right? But the far as this, this subject matter and so forth. But we, we are studying this. We're looking at this. And, and, you know, as we go through each sermon, and today, remember, keep remembering, if you're saved, you're not going to be here. Now, you may ask, well, then why are we going through this? If I'm not going to be here, we're not going to be here, what's the benefit and so forth? Well, it, it is God's word. And we believe that every word of God's word is profitable. And, and so as we are learning and studying of God's word, we, we want to grow it. We want to learn from front to back of the book of Revelation. And, and though I'm not enjoying, well, again, the tribulation part of it, I do believe I'm benefiting, that I'm profiting, that I'm growing in a greater understanding of God and his majestic sovereignty. And that's the goal. That's the purpose for you and I. Now, last week we saw the first four trumpets, and today we're going to see, well, there's three more, but we're going to see number five and six today. And remember, this is a picture of an angel blowing trumpet of announcement. Announcement of coming doom, of judgment. So let's look at chapter 9, verse 1 to 12. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit, and he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke rose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power as the scorpions of the earth as, as power. They are commanded not to harm any tree, but only those or any green thing, any, excuse me, not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or the, any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. Now hold it there. When it talks about seal of, on their foreheads, remember we already seen that. In particular, where God put a seal on the 144,000 Jewish evangelists. That's who it's talking about there. And, and, and so everybody can be hurt except them. Then verse 5 and 6, it says, And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days men will seek death and will not find it, they will desire to die, and death will flee from them. Here people are going to, it's going to be so bad, they're going to commit suicide. And they'll not be successful. Now as we look into chapter 7, it starts talking about these locusts. 
it's like John, his imagination's just gone bonkers, bonkers here, wild, in a nightmare. Verse 7, the shape of the locust was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. Now, the lo- think about what he's saying here, and, and that the locusts look like horses prepared for battle, uh, and their heads uh, wore something like golden crowns and so forth. This is strange stuff. Now, understand, every time we see in Revelation, when we see the term resemble or were like or like, that's where it's moving into symbolism and not literal, okay? So we, we look at verse 8. They had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth, and they had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. They had tails like scorpions, and there was stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men five months, and they had a king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek it was the name Apollyon. One woe is past. Behold, still two more woes are coming after these things. So let's look at trumpet number five. And I'll just say, you know, we're looking at the army from the pit of hell, if you will. I mean, this, the first thing we see here is a horde of, of locusts that comes from the abyss. And it's literally an army of evil, if you will. And, and, and they are coming from this bottom pit that's opened up. Now, there in verse one, we see the mention of a star. Now, we also saw stars mentioned in chapter 8, but, uh, or heavenly bodies, but they were not personified. This one is. This one's personified. It says, to him was given the key. He opened the bottom's pit, or the abyss. Now, some people think this is the devil. I don't. I think this is just a regular angel with this assignment, if you will. And, and so he has an assignment here uh, to... to uh, to open the pit up. Now, also you might see that in the Bible, sometimes, other occasions, angels are referred to as stars when they are personified, as this one is here, and he has a key. Uh, 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 He has the key to the pit. Now, what about the pit? What is that? Well, that's where the Bible says that the demons are, they reside. They are reserved for that day when they are released. Now, is it hell? Probably. Some would say no. They sure paint the picture like hell when you got the smoke and the smoke of, uh, of a furnace like coming out of it and everything. It, if it's not hell, I don't know what it is. It's, it's, it's about as close as you can get to a description of hell. Remember in Luke, remember the demonic man, the wild man of Gadara, uh, where the, the, the demons said to Jesus, don't cast us back into the pit, don't you know, send us back to the abyss. So the legions of evil, the legions of demons here, they didn't want to go back. They weren't ready to be condemned to eternity in that pit here. So that's what we're talking about. Now the word abyss or pit is found some nine times in the New Testament, seven here in Revelation. Now I think this angel we're looking at here in Revelation 9 is the same angel found in Revelation 20, verse 1 to 3. It says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. So when you go back to Revelation 9, I think that angel there is the same angel here in Revelation 20 here. And and so this angel has been given a key that controls the the pit where these demons are in reserve. Now, we need to be very, very thankful that the Lord has not allowed more demons in this world as we live. Because there's many, many, many more in reserve for that day. And they are a veritable army that is coming. So... I want you to notice a couple things here about this demonic army. First of all, this demonic army from the pit appears as a swarm of locusts. Now, I don't know if we can really relate to a swarm of locusts. I know we know what locusts are and so forth, and we see a bunch in the summer. We'll see them this summer, and anytime you get in taller grass water, they're just going everywhere. But, you know, this is what John can relate to, because swarms of locusts, 
biblical proportions a lot of times we think about. And occasionally in this world and places, you will see swarms of locusts in this world. Now, what are we talking about locusts? We're talking about grasshoppers, not cicadas. That's what we call, when I grew up, you know, a cicada is a, a, a locust here in Oklahoma. But a, lo a locust biblical is a grasshopper, small to large and so forth. And a swarm, they're just coming up in large clouds that, you know, covering the sky, that's blocking out the sun. Millions, hordes, masses of them. You know, a swarm is just coming out there and, and, and they he eat anything green. They come to a forest or a field, a crop. When they're done, it's devastated. It's nothing but dirt and a few little stalks here and there. And, and so when they land, you can't help but step on them. And if you walk outside with your mouth open, you just join John the Baptist Club. You know, you're eating uh, locusts here. Now this is why John is describing this this way. Because this whole cloud of them coming up out of the pit, only thing he can relate to is a swarm of locusts. It makes you know, that's what he connects it with. Secondly, they have a power to inflict horrible pain for five months. These are not harmless bugs. These have the power, the authority, to cause terrible pain, suffering upon the world for five months. Now, I don't know exactly or understand yet on that five-month thing, but he said it twice. But it also reminds me, remember we talked about how that God may shorten the days in that time because of pain? Again, I don't believe he's going to shorten the seasons or the, the schedule because he's got a schedule here, five months, something's involved. So shortening the days sounds more like actual the days instead of the whole period of uh, his schedule here. But we also see God's limiting them. God's still in control here. He's, he's not allowing them to go beyond five months. He says, you cannot kill these people. You can ha cause harm. You can inflict pain and suffering in the world. Now, why does he describe them like scorpions? Well, have you ever had scorpion problems at your house? We had them for, for a long time at the Parsonage in our place in New Falls. It was as we kind of got things sealed up. We haven't had any in a long time. And, and, and they're there. Now, the only scorpions in Oklahoma that are native are called the striped bark scorpions. They're considered a pest because they like to come into human structures, and you know, houses, barns, garages, and so forth. They are not considered deadly or lethal to humans. Now, has anybody been stung by a bee? How about a wasp? How about a scorpion? How about all three? Which is worse? To me, a scorpion. I got stung on a finger, and it lasted all day. It was numb. It hurt. Now, I've been stung on knuckles by wasps and everything. They hurt, but they went away faster. And, and it's just a, a longer thing. Now, there's uh, scorpions in the world that are de deadly. But even a non-lethal scorpion can have a tendency or cause severe pain and swelling that lasts for days. Now, scorpions are really of the insect family. You know, the arachnids or the spider family. And they had that long curly tail with a sharp sting around. They don't really carry venom as an antitoxin. And so when a scorpion strikes its prey, the antitoxin strikes the nervous system of its prey. And, and most of the time, if somebody dies, it's not a venom, but it is a reaction. Like a, somebody that uh, reacts to a bee sting. That they, uh, what is it, anaplastic shock? Something like that. Neuro it, it's, it's a neurotoxin here. And so my understanding is that it will constrict the throat, the muscles, and they will literally choke to death. Now, what a terrible way to suffer and die. But God has said, no, you can't kill them. Only pain, suffering here. So God is describing through John's vision here of the pain, of the suffering that's going to be inflicted upon so many people during the tribulation period. Now, the third thing that's about this horde or this swarm of locusts is their leader, the destroyer here. Look at verse 11. It talks about in Hebrew, uh, Abaddon, and in Greek, Apollyon. Now, someone said this is the word used for Satan himself uh, there as the destroyer. Now, literally, the word means destruction, but you personify it, and you got destroyer. Now, is this the devil? It certainly sounds like it. Now, some would say no, but if it's not the devil, it's his twin brother. You know, he, this guy's out there to ruin and to de destroy. He's everything the devil is. 
Y'all, the devil, remember, is a thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus says, I come to give life and give it abundantly. But the devil wants to destroy anything and everything valuable and precious to you and I as God's people. So he's the ultimate leader. If this isn't the ultimate, he's like his second command, something like that. You know, Satan is, is the ultimate leader of all, all the demonic, all that is evil in this world. We see that throughout the scriptures. And, and so we, what we're seeing here is this demonic army that's come to cause pain, to inflict suffering upon mankind during the Great Tribulation period. So now we look at the six trumpets, and we see the death angels are released. Starting in verse 13. Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and the day and the month and the year were released to kill a third of mankind. Now the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision. Those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, hyacinth blue, and sulfur yellow. And the head of the horses were like the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed, which came out of their mouths, or excuse me, by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone, which came out of their mouths, for their power is in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails were, are like serpents, having heads with them, heads, and with them they do harm. Now, Here's what we've learned, first thing, about the sixth trumpet, if you will. It gets worse. Have you noticed how that with everything, it gets worse and worse and worse? I mean, we saw the seals. I mean, it just gets harder and harder and harder. And, and we haven't even seen the bowels, the, the bowls of wrath yet. But everything's just getting worse and more terrible as we go. So we see a picture here of these four death angels. Now, these appear to be... Four angels created specially, specifically for this occasion. Verse 14 and 15 says, says, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates and the four angels who had been kept ready for this very hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. Now currently, the population of our planet is 7.9 approximately billion people. Now by this time, after the rapture, after all the tribulation, you know, death, nuclear explosions, or whatever, you know, the environmental disasters, who knows how many is left? Maybe a third's dead, maybe half, maybe two-thirds gone. Maybe we're down to a third. We don't know. I'm, and, uh, you know, everything's a guess, supposition, if you will. But no doubt, billions are dead, no, uh, and they're missing here. So in this single trifold plague or judgment here, another third of the ones that's left are now going to be killed. Now this boggles imagination to think about what's going on here, but this is exactly what the Apostle John is seeing here. And, and, and again, we see four death angels, four single digits. We see the angels numbered. Anything bigger you know, than single digit, it gets innumerable, heavenly hosts, so forth. Now death angels, again, listen, this isn't the first time we've seen death angels. In the Old Testament, in the book of, of Exodus and so forth, we see the death angel goes through Egypt to kill all the firstborn. And those that have the blood upon the doorposts of their houses, you know, the death angel passes over. You know, so we don't have to worry about death, second death, or the death angel if you are protected by the blood of Jesus. Because that's the good news. We are protected by him. Now, this, these death angels apparently are going to employ an army of 200 million. That's a mind-boggling thought. It's a huge, huge army. In ancient times, the greatest army of all was Xerxes of Greece, and his army was about a million and a half. My understanding of World War II, the United States put together in all forces, Army, Navy, Marines, etc., took together in uniform about 16 million. And that's the 200 million. You know, someone said that if you got them all in ranks out there standing at attention, this army of 200 million would be like a mile wide by 87 miles long. 
That's a big army. And somebody said that the only nation in the world that could muster together an army that size is China. Now, is this a, a one-nation army or is it a combination of nations to get this army? We don't know, but that's the number that we are given here. And this is the Bible teaches the method of which so many are going to be killed is through these soldiers, these weapons. Now, it talks about these warriors being like horses and so forth. And, and, and you know, this is the only way that John can relate. Soldiers and horses. You know, that's all he's ever seen. He's trying to describe the best he can. Heads like lions, and there's smoke coming from the front and from the back, and there's power and all this stuff. What in the world is he talking about? Well, some would venture to say, you know, a, a jet fighter. Could it be an A-10 warthog? You know, if you ever look, get online, Google an A-10 warthog flying and dropping missiles and shooting their, that cannon out front, and, and they're dropping flares in the back. It's fire coming from everywhere, smoke coming from Could it be? I don't know. And it really doesn't matter. It may be fun to speculate. What we need to understand is the destruction all the power, the death, the devastation here, it's going to be great. Now, everything we read up to this point, we need to constantly remember and be grateful we're not going to be here. I am so thankful to God that I'll be in heaven. Now, we quickly look at these two trumpets this morning, but I want to uh, take the remainder of our time to look at the final two verses of this chapter. Let me ask you, how do you think people are going to react to all these judgments, to all what's happened? I mean, judgment after judgment after judgment. I mean, there is thousands, millions of people missing and dead. There's signs in the sky. There's environmental destruction and disaster everywhere. How do you think mankind's going to respond? You would think people would fall on their knees and say, you're right, God, we're wrong, I'm sorry, forgive us. You would think they'd do that. You'd think anybody in the right mind would do that. But what we see is the extent of the madness of sin. How far sin will take you. So I want us to see the, the reaction of remaining of humanity. Look at verse 20 and 21. But the rest of mankind who were not killed by their plague did, did not repent of the works of their hands that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. Can you imagine this? You would think with all that's going on, with God pouring out his judgment, people would bow before God. But instead, we're seeing mankind's hearts getting harder and harder and harder. They're holding their fist up before God and, and refusing to repent. Now notice the sins that's listed here in the tribulation period because this is one of the reasons I think we're so close because the sins that's listed here are prevalent, are prominent sins in our culture, our society, and, and really in every one of the world, across the globe. They're prominent. Look at the five sins. The first one is the sin of false worship. They did not repent of works of their hands. They did not stop worshiping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, idols that cannot see or hear or walk. You know, amazing, it's the devil that's torturing them. It's the demonic army that's wiping them out and killing them right and left, but yet they refuse to quit worshiping demonic forces. Now, I don't have to tell you that the devil's alive and well in Oklahoma that there are places of worship near and far. Now, what the world wants to say is a legitimate religion God calls demonic. It's demonic worship. And so I want you to understand for yourself, for your children, for your grandchildren, anything, anything that takes the place of God, anything that names itself as God, anything that gets between you and God, anything that gets you to worship something else is demonic. It is not of God. It is evil. Now, Satan's a liar. And his chief subject of lying is about God. Because he doesn't want you to trust him. He wants you to doubt God and, and to question God. And at the same time, he wants you to trust him. He wants you to think that he's great and he can solve all your problems, that 
He can make you happy and wealthy, and, and He can give you what you want in this life, and, and He will give you what, what you need. The thing is, the devil's a thief. As Jesus tells us, the thief comes about to steal, kill, and destroy. So you can't trust him with anything. Your life, your freedom, your family, your faith, none of it. He's like a murderous lion. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 5, 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about seeking who, a war, uh, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So don't feed him. In other words, don't get close. Don't dabble with his toys, play with his toys. Don't get involved in anything of the occult. You know, tarot cards, you know, Ouija boards, uh, of uh, palm reading. Don't play around when it comes to these fantasy games and through this spiritualism, to clairvoyance and fortune tellers and that stuff. Those are dangerous. That's the, world, the devil's world. Now, as dangerous as bad as those are, that's not what usually catches Christians. You know, Christians are usually got trapped in religion or the world. The bright lights of the world gets them and draws them away. Selfishness, pleasing the flesh, or a religion that makes them feel good without the truth. Where it goes to works. If a religion starts being man-centered, if it begins or, or starts pointing to you, that you're good enough, then you're becoming an idol worshiper because you're now you're worshiping self. And that's demonic. And, and if you get your eyes off of Christ, the devil wins. That's all he cares about. He doesn't care how you do it, where you go, what happens, just as long as your eyes, your faith is off of Jesus. So one of these days, the prince of this world, he's going to come and the world's going to be blinded. So much so that after all these judgments, after all the trumpets, after all the pain, they still will not repent because they're so blinded to the truth. Second, second sin is the sin of murder. Nor did they repent of their murders. Now, we've had murder since Cain killed Abel. And, and no doubt murder is one of the greatest evils that's ever come upon. It's one of the worst things that ever happened. And this is why capital punishment exists, you know, most society usually understands that it's intolerable, and that murder is intolerable, that somebody's a murderer is no longer fit to live in a civilized society. Now, usually when a man or person is, is caught in murder, convicted of murder, and put on death row, and they're facing their ultimate judgment, somewhere in there they will repent. They'll confess to the clergy, to God, that they've done wrong. But occasionally you'll come across some that's so hard that if they're dying, they're laughing at the world. And by what we're seeing on TV, there are some that just, you know, violence is a way of life. And it's growing in certain sectors and subcultures of our society. They just think that they have a right to get even, to shoot, to stab, to run over, to kill. We saw just this week in South Carolina some 8 to 10-year-old boys playing baseball, Little League baseball, and out in the parking lot, some teenagers get in a fight. Instead of fist fight, they pull out the guns, and they begin to shoot at each other, with, and they've shot some 50 rounds. And how come teenagers have those guns, that many, that much ammunition? Why haven't they been taught to just settle their difference with a fist? But you know what the amazing thing is? God protected them that night because nobody got hit. They must be the worst shots in the country shoot that many rounds and nobody, and thankfully they didn't get hit. But don't blame the gun. It's not the gun's fault. It's people. It's like Adrian Rogers to say that the heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. And of course, we saw Friday. A man who just got out of prison for 10 years of kidnapping, rapes and murders a two-year-old girl in Eden. Now, I pray for God's grace that he will work in a great way in that man's life. But between now and then, for justice to work all the way to the ultimate price of justice. We cannot put fear in people's lives. There cannot be a deterrent without some kind of punishment. Now, the thing is, in those days, murder will be commonplace. From killing of babies in wounds to euthanasia of the aged and, and the invalid to the meanness of streets. There will be killing without remorse, without regret, and without repentance. 
Third sin we see is the sin of sorcery. Now this is kind of interesting here. It says, and they did not repent or of their sorceries, or the NIV says magic heart. Now, the Greek word there for sorcerer's magic arc is pharmakia. Now, I don't think you have to have a degree of higher education or anything like that to understand what that word means. That's, that's the word where you get pharmacy. Drugs. You see, you go back to ancient times, when you look at witchcraft and sorcery and so forth, there is usually pharmacy, pharmacia, uh, potions, drugs involved, because they're wanting people to hallucinate they're wanting people to feel euphoria or ecstasy or have nightmares or all kinds of things in their witchcraft and things they're doing. Now, what are we talking about here in drug use in the end times? Well, after all that they've seen and gone and experienced, and they're not turning to God, they've got to have something to cope with. They're going to turn to something to calm their fears, to deal with things. And we know today... People turn to drugs all the time. We got marijuana, meth, cocaine, uh, crack, and of course there's over-the-counter drugs. Legalizing marijuana in whatever form has not solved the problem. It's just made it more complicated. And, and we know that over, uh, prescription drugs is a good thing, but it's also a problem. And, and so there are people getting addicted to, to prescription drugs. Now, if you need it, if the, your regular doctor prescribes it, then take it. I mean, I've had enough surgeries. I understand taking some pain, mill, pain pills for every now and then until, and getting over it as quick as possible. It, they're legitimate. But when we start depending upon this other source that affects the mind we're our, and our faith, that we're not focused on and trusting the Lord, that's getting into sorceries and pharmacia. That's drug uh, control of our mind. Then we see the sexual sin. You know, this should be no surprise that this is on this list. Uh, and the, the Greek word there is pornonia, which is where we get pornography. Now, does it surprise you that after all the millions of people that are dead, and in this time of history, that people are, that sexual sins is still a problem? You know, promis sexual promiscuity and so forth is still prominent in the world. Now, sex is a constant problem or, or topic of books, movies, sitcoms, of uh, comedians, of the news, and the classroom. When people want to teach our children about sex, and we're not just talking about birds and the bees, we're talking about the perversions of homosexuality, the transgender lifestyle, and the various variants of that, before they reach third grade, the power of pornonia is in control. Pay attention, it's in the news. Florida is having a big battle with, with what's going on there, you know, Disneyland and so forth, because they want it free in the school to teach our kids this stuff before third grade. Now, excuse me for saying I told you so, but for 20 plus years I've been warning not only that kind of stuff's coming down the pike, not only are they trying to okay and approve and teach our children about the the perversions of LGBTQT lifestyle, and, and I heard this week uh, they've added some more. It's 2S LGBTQT. What does that stand for? But what is coming down, that's been coming down, but it was in the news again this week, is becoming more and more blatant, is the approval and legalization of adult child sex. Now this is sad. It's sickening. And with this type of, of sinfulness, that's in our world already, does that not tell you and I how close we are to the tribulation? And then we see the fifth and final sin, the sin of theft. Now, if you watch the news, well, never mind, because the news media is not paying attention. They're not shining light on crime these days because it might shine a bad light upon those in political power. But when we talk about crime, we're not just talking about crime surges. We're talking about there's a different attitude these days. There's a boldness, a blatantness about a sign of di or about this sin of crime. There's, they have no fear of the justice system. They have no fear of being punished. They have no fear of the police or those in power or authority. It's done publicly. It's done in, in uh, uh, open daylight. You know, we've got smash and grabs. We've got grab and goes. We've got mobs 
rushing into stores and grabbing all they can and marching out right past the, the tellers, right past security guards, right back into their cars and running off because they don't fear that they're going to get caught or, or get in trouble whatsoever. Paul Harvey, who I used to love to listen to, told a story about a shop owner in inner city Chicago years ago where he got robbed seven times in seven months by the same guy. And the police asked him, said, did he look, was anything noticeable different about him each time? The shop owner said, yeah, he was dressed better each time. Well, in many of our inner cities, many of our cities today, they are not prosecuting criminals. And so, you know, tax-paying, hard-working, law-abiding citizens are being abused not only by the criminals, but by our politicians. Now, you remember the, the riots of last year. Now think about after all these judgments and all the chaos and all that's gone on, when this time comes, it's going to be, you know, a fire sale. It's going to be just an open season of thievery. What the Bible is basically telling you and I, during the tribulation period, all values, citizenship values, all these things that keep people in check, even non-Christians, are gone. It's going to be total evil chaotic. Now, ladies and gentlemen, here's the good news. Our God loves us. So much so he sent his son to die on a cross for us. So when Jesus came the first time, he came as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. When he comes the next time, he's coming as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. So you can fall under his mercy or you can fall under his wrath. It's your choice. Now, if you will seek him and accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, you will experience his mercy, his grace, and his salvation. But if you resist his grace, his mercy, you will experience his wrath one day. It's your choice. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Do you personally know the Lord Jesus Christ? Don't just assume so. Look deep in your heart. Look for that, that truth, that evidence, that peace. That's found not in religion, not in feelings, but in the Word of God and the Spirit of God who will bear witness of your salvation. The Scripture is written that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to trust, believe in Him each day. Find your peace in Christ. Keep your eyes on Christ. Keep focused and living for Christ. Because that day, that hour, we don't know when it's coming, will come when we're least expecting. Father, I pray that you'll speak to each heart, that your spirit would edify your church, that you'll strengthen our faith and our commitments, and that we will see the lost, that we'll see right now those, those neighbors, those we work with, our children, grandchildren, those friends that need Christ, that we will do everything in our power, which is first and foremost rely upon your power, to bring them to Christ, that we'll live in a way that pleases you, that is a witness to them, and that we will share from little ways to big ways, in any way we can, how they can, lead, how they can come to Christ and know Christ as their Lord and Savior. Father, empower us, speak to us, bless this time, this place, these people, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand and sing, you come today. 347, come on.